um, help us in a, a, a very trying time uh, that we're living in. Um, I uh, uh, can't wait until November 3rd is come and gone, and then uh, people will like me again, and uh, it will be all good. Um, I uh, uh, want to say this, though, before we start, and if you have your Bible or if you're on your, your phone or whatever, turn to Acts chapter 15. Uh, that's where we'll kind of be hanging out today, but uh, I, I I was in a, a church, a Methodist church in Russell Springs, Kentucky, when I was 22 years old. Uh, I had been drinking since I was 14 years old. I had started doing drugs at a very young age. Um, never really had a propensity to addiction. I just liked them. And um, I had chased a girl into a church uh, because that was the only way that uh, my friends told me that she would talk to me. And so uh, I, I went one week and, and didn't really listen to what the, the preacher was saying. I just wanted to make sure she saw that I was there. Uh, she didn't really care, so I decided I'm going to give it one more shot. Uh, I went back the next week and uh, the, the preacher, and, and I can say this, um, my, my mom is here with me this morning because uh, Kendra is, is leading worship uh, at another uh, uh, church, but um, the God of the universe had set up a message uh, to come out of that man's mouth that day. Um, billions and billions and billions of years ago, God decided that on this very day that um, this preacher was going to talk about uh, um, unconditional love. And I understood what he was speaking of because of my mom. Uh, Little did I know at the time that her love for me is rubbish compared to father's. (laughs) But, but, the only way that I know how to respond to somebody loving me is to love them back. And so if there was this God in heaven that loved me, and I associated it with the love that she had for me, then I can get down with him. I love him too. And I gave my life to the Lord that day. Um, I can tell you that... Uh, and I can say this pretty confidently. Probably still got high that night. It wasn't a it wasn't a, a, an immediate change, and that might make some of you uncomfortable. That was just my journey. Uh, there's a, a work that began in my life, but I went up to the altar and, and I felt free from all of these things. And then they they say this thing like, you know, if you've given your life to the Lord th- today, there's somebody that wants to talk to you. Go and talk to them. And you know, usually they give you a Bible or something. And And the conversation went something like, I'm so proud of you. I'm so excited for you. Uh, Everything that we said is true. You are free. You're forgiven for your sins. You're a child of God. And I'm like, yes, yes, yes. And then they said, but now you need to start doing this and this and this and this. And um, they were right. But I was immediately kind of being indoctrinated that if I wanted to please this father that just set me free, that I have to do all of these things. And I want to say to you this morning that it took me a long time to get over that (laughs) bondage. Because... His love for me and my freedom in him has nothing to do with what I bring to the table. The only thing that I bring to the table in salvation is sin. He takes care of everything else. Now, I'm going to say some things today, and I just want you to know this. That there are truths in this word that we should die for. For me, there's only one. There's only one truth in the Bible that I would lay my life down for. And that is the only way to the Father is through Christ Jesus. Somebody puts a gun to my head and they say, do you believe in tongues? Like, I'm not dying over that. I'm like, I don't know. What do you believe? (laughs) Or what's your stance on baptism? I don't know. Whatever you think. Like, I'm not willing to die over that. 
If somebody puts a gun in my head and they say, denounce Jesus, I'm waking up on the other side of eternity and I'm happy with my decision. So there's only a truth for me. Maybe there's more for you, but there's only one truth for me that I'm willing to die for. Then there's other truths in here that we should divide for. Like there's certain sects of religion that would say that the leader over their church, everything that he says is infallible. I don't think so. I think there's only one word that's infallible and we can't take anything from it or add anything to it. So I'm not going to, there's no real reason for me to worship alongside them. It's okay though. I love them, but there's no real reason. We should divide. You, You worship there and I'll worship here. It's all good. But then there's a whole bunch of truths in here that it's okay for us to debate. So there's truths we die for, one maybe, a handful of truths that we should divide for, a handful. But for the most part, there's a lot of truths in there that we should talk about, we should debate. We 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 should really get to the bottom of. And then the entire rest of the Bible is filled with truths that you should just decide on your own. It's okay. And it's okay for your decision to be different than my decision because it doesn't have anything to do with our standing in eternity. And when we become comfortable with this together, we stop getting frustrated with each other. We love a heck of a lot better. We sleep better at night. We're not bound up by what other people are posting on social media. We're not unfriending people because they are voting for somebody different than we're voting for. And we can sleep and we're just healthier because we're not so bound up by this. So what I'm going to talk about today, it's not a truth to die for. It's not a truth to divide for. But my request that I'm asking you as a brother is that you just hear it and just decide on your own what it's going to do in your life. So let's read Acts 15, almost the whole thing. We're going to go to like verse 35. But some men came down from Judea. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, so follow along in your Bibles. And they were teaching the brothers that unless you're circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now for this message's sake, when we talk about circumcision, it's symbolic of the Old Covenant. So Old Testament law. And uh, we're, we're going to talk about a word that I know that you're all um, familiar with, but we're going to talk about legalism a little bit today. And, and, and legalism essentially is like this unhealthy following of formula. Okay, like you're just like crazy passionate about following something specific. A law is what it's talking about. So um, circumcision, symbolic for Old Testament, legalism, passionately following formula or law, okay? According to the custom of Moses, so there's old book, uh, you cannot be saved. They can't, unless you're following the old way, you cannot be saved. Now, here's a funny thing. So, uh, you ever been like listening to somebody speak and everything's going fine and then all of a sudden they say something and you're like, wait, wait, what? What did he just say? Kind of like every time Donald Trump speaks, like everything's going fine and then you're like, ah, why? It just happens sometimes. And so, uh, he's saying things, everything's fine. And then he says, "Ah, unless you follow the old way, you can't be saved. No, something's not right here. So Paul and Barnabas, they they have this debate. This is a good thing. This is healthy. They have this debate with them. And Paul and Barnabas and some of the others, they were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia, Samaria, describing in detail the the conversion of the Gentiles. And it brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. 
But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it's necessary. So here we go again. We had it in verse 1. We got it again in verse 5. It's necessary to circumcise them in order to keep the law of Moses. So it's, it's necessary for them to follow the old way in order for them to be saved. The apostle and the elders, they were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stands up. Thank God for Peter, Paul, Barnabas, James. They're all kind of there. Listen to what they say. Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you. And by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God who knows the heart bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. Remember Peter was there, he's preaching this first message. He sees signs and wonders and he's saying, listen to what happened. Listen to the freedom that they experienced. And he made no distinction between Jew and Gentile, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Hmm. Freedom is only freeing if you accept it. If you add to the rules and to the regulations that you were given, you do not have the grace and the power to be able to follow it. Remember back in Genesis when God said, don't eat of the fruit? Remember that story? And then uh, the tempter comes along, and, and what does Eve say? She says, uh, he told us not to eat it or to touch it. Yeah, no, 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 that's, 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 that's not what he said. They start adding things. We have this tendency to do this. He says, so why are you doing this? Why are you putting this yoke on the neck of the disciples? You're not going to be able to bear it. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And all of the assembly fell silent, and they listened. So so Peter speaking now, Barnabas and Paul, they step up. And they, they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. So they say, you know, this is why I believe, because all of these things that happened amongst the Gentiles. And after they finished speaking, James replied. So now James is there. And he said, brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take them uh, from them a people for his name. And with these words of the prophets agreed just as it is written. So he goes to the old book, Amos, and he says, after this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. And I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from old. Verse 19. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols and from sexual morality and from what has been strangled and from blood. And for from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, uh, leading men among the brothers with the following letter. The brother both, the brothers both, the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words unsettling to your minds, although we gave them no instructions, it has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Men who have risked their lives for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. Keep yourselves from these and you will do well. Farewell. Verse 30. 
So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when everyone had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace. The brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the day. Thank you for the opportunity to gather as a faith family. Uh, there's been uh, so much uh, that, that we haven't been able to do for so long, and, and I'm thankful, Lord, to be in this house amongst those that love and worship you. I pray, God, uh, today that your word uh, would go on to uh, fertile soil. I pray, Lord, that it would produce fruit, uh, fruit that remains, and, and God, that fruit would be freedom in our own lives, a freedom expressed through our lives that might show others the goodness and love of, of our Lord and Savior. And God, I, I pray that, that the, the result would be lives changed in Leesburg, Lake County, and throughout the world because you came to dwell in our lives. We love you, and we thank you for this moment that we have together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, I... Uh, I have to remind myself daily of the implications of the gospel. Um, I, I think that sometimes we make assumptions that, that this thing comes easier to some than to others. And it just to set the record straight, I'm a train wreck. <laughs> the things that go on up here don't often make it out of this, but if they do, it's not good. Like, I struggle daily with different things. And, and a big struggle is just being confident in, in knowing what God said about me. And that everything else that everybody wants to say has no implication on my standing with him. Like me, love me, hate me, like what I say, don't like what I say. It's okay. Yeah, if we're going to clap, let's clap. God is good. Amen. My standing with God has nothing to do with my performance for God. It's the only relationship in existence that works that way. You can lose a lot of friends by doing one thing, by saying one thing. Uh, I mean, the reality is, is that even our most intimate and personal relationships can be ruined, spouses, family members, whatever it might be. But there's one relationship that has nothing to do with our performance. It has everything to do instead with Jesus' performance for me. And we've got to remind ourselves of that. It was his life, his death, his resurrection. It is my only hope to have a right standing before Father. Because if I forget what he's done, I lean towards adding requirements onto myself. And when I do that, undoubtedly, I'll fail. And when that happens, I start questioning myself, self-esteem goes down, anxiety comes in, depression. All of these things begin to be triggered because I've added requirements onto myself, and I'm convinced that this isn't just a John thing. It's not just a personal tendency. And the reality is, is it, it's not just a modern tendency. This isn't like a, a 21st century church issue. Um, it, it's not just a human tendency. I believe that this is a Christian tendency that all believers have a tendency to forget in their own lives the truth and the power of the gospel. We saw what was happening in Acts 15. Go to Galatians 3, if you would, verse 1. Paul pours out his life in Galatia. He preaches the gospel. The church is established there. Things are happening. He moves on. He's like, all right, we're good here. These are a solid set of believers. I'm moving on to another town. And as soon as he does, soon after, he gets word from the Galatian church that all of the truth that was preached there, they had moved on to something else. And listen to what Paul says, Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Oh, foolish Galatians. 
Like one of the things that I, I admire about uh, Paul is that he's like just gangster in what he says. Like he doesn't care. He just speaks truth. He's not worried about what anybody thinks. He, he's like, you, you, fools, what are you doing? What's happening there? He says, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish having begun by the spirit that you're now being perfected by the flesh? He said, you accepted, you received Jesus not by anything of your own doing. Why are you trying to do something in order to earn that now? Martin Luther, he said it this way. This is good. Listen to this. Listen slowly. The law is divine and holy. The law is right. Let the law have its glory even, but yet no law be it ever so divine and holy, ought to teach me that I am justified and I shall live through it. So for me, let me put it, there's no law good enough to justify us. None. They're good. It's good, but it doesn't justify us. Justification meaning that It is just as though I've never sinned, justified, clean and holy and pureless before a clean and holy and pureless and perfect God. That when I say yes to Jesus and he forgives my sin, dare I say I stand before God as pure and holy as he is. And when we are justified, it's just as if I had never sinned in my life. There is no law, Martin Luther is saying, that can do that. Although law is good, it can't do that. It's not that good. Listen, I grant that it may teach me. Okay? It's important. It may teach me how I ought to love God and my neighbor, how I'm also to live in love, soberness, patience, but it will not show me how I'm delivered from sin, the devil, death, or hell. He says here, he says, instead, I must take counsel of the gospel, not the law. I must take counsel of the gospel. I must hearken to the gospel which teaches me not what I ought to do, but what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, hath done for me. That he suffered and died to deliver me from sin and death. The gospel wills me to receive this and to believe it. And this is the truth of the gospel. And then I love how he finishes. Listen to his conclusion. Most necessary it is, therefore, that we should know the gospel well, Teach it unto others and beat it into their heads continually. (laughs) So, ever so lovingly and ever so gently and ever so humbly, I would love today to beat the gospel into your heads. (laughs) And in in so doing so, In so doing so, beat legalism, this adherence to law, out of your hearts. Gospel in, legalism out, okay? So, here's the thing. Legalism, it's crazy attractive. It's true. And we're going to talk about it. Um, the essence of the appeal of legalism. It talks about it in verse 1 and in verse 5 of Acts 15. He says, unless you are following the law, unless you're adhering to the custom of Moses, he, he, says, he says flat out, you cannot be saved. That's that moment. Everything's going fine. And you're like, wait, wait, what? What did I just hear? 
Now, this isn't the entirety of their message, right? So Luke's hanging out, and I'm sure that Luke had this moment. He's there. Everything's going good. These are young believers. They're praising God. There's some some former Jews that have accepted Jesus as their Savior, and everything is going great. And Luke's there. He's an intelligent man, a physician. He's listening along, and then he hears this. And he's like, oh, heck no. I'm writing, I'm writing to Paul right now because this is not good. And so he starts to reach out to these believers. And so we don't have the whole message, but we have that thing, right, that really stood out to him. Did he just say that we can't be saved unless we follow the law? And, 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 and then he expounds on that in verse 5. It says, some of the believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees rose up and they said, it's necessary to circumcise them in order for them to keep the law of Moses. And so we told you, like, this idea, it's, it's, it's symbolic of the Old Covenant. they got to keep the Old Covenant if they're going to be saved. And, and now, hear me, though, this is not what they're saying. They're not saying Jesus is wrong and the law of Moses is right. They're not saying pick one or the other. They're not saying forget about the cross, forget about his life, forget about the resurrection. It's all about the law of Moses. They're not saying those things. What they're saying is is that it's Jesus plus. And I don't know about you, but I have this issue where I'm always fighting. That day in that Methodist church, it was just Jesus. But give the church 30 seconds, and it was Jesus plus some stuff. And, and, And we struggle with this. But there's a reason for it. Hear me, it's not all bad. There's a reason for it. And so they're not saying it's just Moses. They're saying it's Jesus plus. They were not setting out to deny Jesus But they were saying, eh, he's just not enough. It's got to be Jesus plus something else. And what I want you to understand is that we all have this appeal at certain times. But none of us, born again by the Spirit of God, ever set out to do that. That's never our intent that we want to add something to Jesus that him uh, alone is enough. None of us say, like, none of us ever wake up on, like, a a Thursday, and say, man, it's a great day. You know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to get up. I'm going to read my Bible, and and I'm going to pray a little bit, and somewhere around 1 o'clock, I'm going to deny the sufficiency of Jesus. Like like no uh, regenerative Christian believer ever sets out to do that. That's not a goal. That's not a life goal. But it happens. Over and over and over, personally, corporately, from these platforms, it happens all of the time. But we don't set out to do it. It's never done with intent. What happens is, is that it's rooted in my desire to have acceptance from God. And so we find out these things. It happens all over the place. Legalism creeps in. This tendency to choke out the life that is in Jesus, it's amongst all of us. And there's a reason for it. Uh, Legalism has an attraction because uh, uh, there's this uh, alluring thing to it because I want to be accepted by God. And I know... That um, God, uh, uh, that you have this same thing. You want to be liked by God. We want to be approved by God. And, And we know that God likes holiness, right? He says that a couple times. Therefore, it's easy for us to say, well, if he likes holiness and if he likes righteousness and he likes all of these things, then I just connect the dots. And if he likes it, then I'm going to do more of that. And if I do more of that, then maybe he'll like me more. And so we start adding. Maybe he'll approve of me more. Maybe he'll love me more. Uh, Maybe he'll accept me more if I just do all of these things. And every believer, I'm convinced, bends that way sometimes. Um, 
it's a universal tendency, I think, that, that we see um, uh, all throughout the Scripture. Uh, but here's the thing that we've got to understand. It's not the half-hearted that struggle with legalism. It's not those that are like standing on the edge thinking, you know, I'm not really sure, but I, I think I kind of like this Jesus. Like, they're not legalistic. The ones that struggle with legalism are the ones that are dedicated and devoted to the things of God. These are the people, and many of them are us, that by God's grace, we count ourselves amongst them, that I'm dedicated to God, I'm devoted to His Word. I want to learn and grow and go through this sanctification process in my life. I desire for that to happen. Uh, Those are the people that are prone to legalism. I want to teach. I want to show others. I want to witness. I want to be all of these things. Those are the people that are are prone to legalism in Christianity. Uh, The religious leaders of Jesus' day, the Pharisees, they loved the Word of God. They taught the Word of God. They were zealous for holiness and righteousness. They knew the Word of God. I would suspect that if you were a parent during Jesus' day and you're having a picnic outside and the Pharisee walked by, you might point him out to your son and say, Son, when you get older, you want to be just like that man. They loved the Word of God. Yet, you know what Jesus said about them in one sermon, by the way? He said they were hypocrites, fools, blind guides, serpents, brood of vipers, whitewashed tombs, and sons of hell. One sermon he said that. They loved the word of God. They were zealous for holiness. But they were the epitome of legalism in Jesus' day. That's what he thought about them. That's what he had to say about them. They cared more about external righteousness. Oh, Jesus then they did the righteousness that was standing right before them in Christ and Christ alone. The early church struggled with legalism. It would be awesome if Jesus came and went and then we turn over the book into the New Testament church, the book of Acts, and legalism just gone. But it wasn't. We read verse 1. We see what they're trying to do in verse 5. It says, but some believers. If you go back in Acts 15, it says, but some believers. These weren't outsiders just coming in, trying to bring dissension and division. But some believers. These weren't pagans. These were missionaries that had come all the way from Judea down through Antioch to spread a message. They were devoted. They were giving, they were willing to sacrifice their lives, yet teaching falsely and blindly things that weren't freeing, but things that were binding people up. Paul says, I am astonished. In Galatians 1, verse 6 through 9, really kind of at the end, he says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ, and you are turning to a different gospel. So Paul says it's possible for us to be freed by the gospel and then in trying to please him, we turn to a different gospel, a false gospel. A gospel where there's no good news in it. And so the religious leader in Jesus' day struggled. Turn over to the, to the New Testament church, struggled with the, little John Abner, 2020, struggles with legalism. I would suspect to say that many of you struggle with this in your own personal life. I'm not good enough. I don't do enough. Think about it. How often do we base our standing with God, our acceptance before God, 
Like his view on us, on how much we read the Bible this week. Like it even happens when we come into corporate worship. Like I've found myself worshiping him more freely on weeks that I've like hit a home run. Like man, I witnessed to that guy and that guy and that guy. I read my Bible like at least four out of the seven days and I prayed without ceasing, right? Just like he tells me to. And I did all these things. Yes, I'm worshiping you. But give me a bad week, which is like the other 51, right? And I come in and we're shamed. Can hardly raise our hands. And when in reality, that's the day that we ought to be worshiping him the most because he still loves me even amidst the train wreck that is John, the mess that is me. But we do it, we base our standing on, on, on we, we base what we think God thinks about us on how much, how long I read my Bible this morning, how early I got up to pray, uh, how much I fast, how much I give, uh, how consistent my family goes to church to worship. We let other people make us feel bad for not doing these things. <laughs> this, is, this is my favorite phone call on Tuesdays when I don't go to church on Sunday. Just call to tell you I missed you on Sunday, brother. No, you're not. You're calling me to tell me that you recognize that I wasn't there on Sunday. Now, I'm not going to answer your phone calls anymore on Tuesday. I'll answer on Friday, because if you're still thinking about me then, then I'll answer. But we know what that is. We know exactly what's happening. How often do we participate in small group? What kind of father am I? What kind of husband am I? What kind of brother am I? How zealous am I? How righteous am I? How holy am I? Let me be clear, just so that Moses does invite me back. I'm not saying that any of those things in and of themselves are bad. None of them. They're all good. We need to be here. I I, I am not the man that I am without the the fellowship, without the assembling of the few. Period. Without my time in the Word, this is the thing that has the power to change lives. I am who I am today because of the Word of God. So I told you about the girl that I met in the church. I married her. We've been married 19 years this December. And um, the first thing that happens after I give my life to the Lord is uh, I'm 22 years old. She buys me a teenage Bible because she understood what she was dealing with, right? Because guys are teenagers until they're like 32 or something like that. And so she buys me this teenage Bible. And I graduated high school. Uh, I've dropped out of college three or four times. I dropped out of seminary, so that was interesting. Um, And... uh, she buys me this Bible, and uh, I can read just fine. I just don't remember. I don't retain things. And so she buys me this teenage Bible, and she starts reading it to me. I think about that, how precious yeah. that, that time, yeah. that, that gift is. So what ends up happening is, is I fall in love with the Word, not based, on, not based on the guy that told me I had to, right, but just because it is life-changing. I fall in love with the Word of God. And um, uh, my weakness is that I can't just read it and recite it. I got to read it and I got to read it and I got to read it and I got to read it. And praise be to God, something happens about that 18th time that I read it. Truth starts jumping off the pages to me. And then I get to regurgitate it to groups of people. I said, I did this for years, seven times a week. Barely graduated high school. Because I fell in love with him and what he has to say. Not based on anything else. I moved to Florida and I end up at a church that has no uh, discipleship program. But you know what I know about discipleship programs? It doesn't matter how good they are. If you don't want to be discipled, you're never going to be discipled. And the other side of that is is it doesn't matter how bad they are, how non-existent they are. If you want to be, you will find a way. So the pastor at the time, my spiritual father, uh, Pastor Cox, uh, he says, well, just come to my house on Tuesdays. And we'll just start talking about this. And one thing leads to another. And here we sit. Because of a love for the word, not because of what anybody else said. And so all of those things are good. We do read our Bible. We do pray. It does say to pray without ceasing. But there is a danger. A a guy named Sinclair Ferguson, 
he identified with this danger. He said, every day we're tempted to smuggle our character into his works of grace. Okay, I had a really good day today. God's happy with me. This doesn't work that way. Every day, we're tempted to smuggle what we've done into his work. And I would suggest that we're going to fight that fight until the day we die. And so we have to be warned against it. We have to to fight against it. We will always battle, I call him, this little legalist that resides inside of me. But Acts 15 shows us that there's hope. So I'm going to talk about two things. Let me land the plane. One good, one good, one bad. First of all, legalism is absurd. So see the absurdity of legalism. It doesn't work. In Acts chapter 15, verse 7, um, and and then following, Paul gives this speech. He says in verse 6, he says, The apostles and the elders are gathered together to consider this matter. And then we see what happens as they start to settle these arguments that they're dealing with. Um, One of the elements is, and and, and they just speak to it, is that uh, legalism is not the eternal plan of God. It was never the plan of God. This is what I mean. This is what uh, God never, ever intended. He never intended in the Old Testament. He never intended in the Gospels, not in Acts, not in the uh, uh, epistles, not in uh, Revelation, not in our lives. God never intended for a single person to be saved by their own hands. Baptism, water baptism doesn't save you. Water baptism is like this ring. I wear one on both hands. I got a ring the day I got married. Uh, my wife and I, we uh, uh, re- renewed our vows on a, a mission trip in Russia. And uh, in, in Europe, they wear their rings on their right hand. And so I wear a ring on, on both hands. Uh, the wedding ring is particularly important to me um, for several reasons. But this ring on or off of my finger makes me no more married. All it is is an outward symbol of an inward commitment. And so I accept Jesus in my heart and then I go get baptized because he led the way in that example. It was never intended to be anything that I did. It was always what he did. And so we got to understand the absurdity of this. It is not God's plan. Everybody in the Old Testament, we're looking forward to a Redeemer that is Christ Jesus. Everybody in the New Testament is looking back at a Redeemer that is Christ Jesus, that lived a life that you and I are supposed to live but can't. Died a death that we deserve to die on our behalf. Defeated death, hell, and the grave. The tomb is empty. And when we put our eyes to him and we say yes to him, we're washed clean. He comes to dwell inside of us and we become his. Based on what he did. That's been the plan since before Genesis 1. It's always been the plan. The lamb slain. Before the foundation of the earth. We know this to be true. So understand the absurdity of legalism. God always and forever intended for salvation to be by faith alone in Christ alone. That's the point. That has always been the plan. So it doesn't make sense. It's absurd to say, all right, God, that was a really cool plan, but I got a better idea. Let's do it my way. And when we do that, we we have this tendency of creating this legalistic plan as a way to earn favor before God. And I want you to see these guys that are speaking in Acts 15, they knew it was absurd and they had all reached that, that conclusion based on what they saw. So Peter stands up and he says, listen, God's got a plan and this is how I know because of his Holy Spirit. 
you guys can read about it at the beginning of Acts. He's preaching and Gentiles are hearing the word and they're trusting in Jesus and the gospel is saving them. And then he says, uh, uh, you know how I know it? He says, I know it because of the Holy Spirit, that God gave them the Holy Spirit just like he gave to us. And he says, you know how I know they got the Holy Spirit? Because they spoke in tongues. Now, don't go, don't get all Pentecostal on me. Because you don't have to be, you don't have to speak in tongues to be saved either. They want you to think that, but it's just not true. It's legalistic. Don't add to it. But he says, this is how I know they were, because it was wild. Y'all should have been there. But I know it's true. Because I saw this. And then Paul and Barnabas get up. And they say, this is how we know it's true. We know it's true because he bore witness to us, to the Gentiles. We know this happened. We know that God's plan has always been for us to be redeemed through Jesus because the Gentiles, there's one verse in there in verse 12. It says, all the assembly felt silence in response to what Peter says. And then Paul and Barnabas step up and they listen to what Paul and Barnabas are saying. And it says, they related what signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles. He did amazing things in their midst to validate his plan was always the same. Then James steps steps up. And James says, this is how I know it's true. So Peter says, Holy Spirit. Paul and Barnabas say, look at the Gentiles. James points them back to the Old Testament. Amos chapter 9. He begins to read there in, in Acts 15, or he begins to recite in Acts 15, verses 15 through 18, that God told us in the Old Testament that this was going to happen. So it's not unexpected. It's not something that's unprecedented. God's plan was revealed in the Old Testament and realized in the New Testament that God always intended to save people, not on the basis of what they've done, but on the basis of Messiah. And it's such a beautiful thing until we start adding to it and ruining it. Legalism is absurd because it sets aside the eternal plan of God. All right, and this is how we deal with it. Here's the antidotes. Legalism, we must remember, it threatens the mission that God has entrusted to us. If, if I don't have the message that it's Christ and Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, then I don't have a, I don't have a message. What, what do I have? Like, what do I have to offer a world that is bound to hell unless they say yes to Jesus? Like, my music? No, my, my, uh, my, our movies? Our conversation? Again, what I say might add value, and I hope and I pray that it does. But the only thing that is life-changing is his word. And so if we start to add to the gospel It threatens our mission. We don't have anything. You know what Paul said? Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And I'll be honest, I'm not ashamed of saying things that others struggle with because it's Christ and Christ alone. And then Paul, you say, well, Paul, why aren't you ashamed of the gospel? Because it's the power of God unto salvation. It's the only hope that we have for whoever believes, first the Jew, then the Gentile. It's our power. The message is our power. And if we lose that power, we lose the the message, then we've lost the mission. So when we give in to legalism, we lose the mission. We got to remember, another antidote number two, legalism obscures God's glory. You know this, he's zealous. Like don't, don't, don't steal his thunder. (laughs) Right? Like, like if we know anything about Father, like he deserves all the glory for everything that he's done. James says, he says, brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to do what? To take a people for his name. 
God intended always to be glorified through salvation. His people, through the blood of his son. And any time that we give in to legalism, any time that we suggest that I can add to my justification, I am simultaneously robbing God the glory that's due only to him. So please, don't ever look at a Christian and say, man, look at everything he's done. Look at that man or that woman and say, look at what Jesus has done. Don't rob God of his glory. Third thing, legalism undermines our salvation. One writer said, legalism is useless against the devil. This is what he meant. No law ever defeated him. No law ever robbed Satan of his strength. No law ever plundered his domain or released his captives or broke his back or cast him out or rebuked him or bound the strong man. Whatever you want to say. No law did it. It was Jesus. That's who defeated the enemy. And if you you read carefully, he did it all the way back in Genesis. Everything else was just pointing to him. You know, one of my favorite scriptures in Hebrew is, uh, in, in Hebrews is, uh, man, I'm going to really jack this up if I don't go there. Check this out. This is so good. This is not a notes. This is, this is, a, this is a free freebie. Hebrews chapter 11. I know you guys have read this, but verse 22. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. I'm sorry, 23. By faith, Moses. You guys remember him? The guy, the law of Moses that they were just talking about? This is mind-blowing. When he was born, he was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful. So we're in Hebrews. Just for anybody that may be, like, just getting here, and Hebrews is New Testament. It's after Jesus died that, that death and defeated uh, death, hell, and the grave. He's, he's, he's ascended. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father right now. Hebrews, they're writing to these, these young uh, uh, Jewish boys and girls that are now Christians, and they're struggling, okay? And uh, it's this amazing letter. In, in chapter 11, verse 23, Moses, Old Testament, all the way back at the beginning, He's hidden as a child, and he's beautiful, uh, and, and they hid him because they weren't afraid of the king's edict. Listen to what verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He could have had everything that was the king's at that point, but he didn't want it. He wanted to hang with the people of God. Look at verse 26. We're talking about Moses, Old Testament. He considered the reproach of Christ greater than the wealth and the treasures of Egypt. Moses, all the way back at the beginning, was looking forward to the redemptive one that God was sending, Messiah, Jesus. Legalism obscures God's glory. It undermines our salvation. It took God the Son, a cross and an empty grave, to do the things that the law could never ever do. So let's don't undermine the salvation of Christ that was purchased by his own blood by suggesting there's anything whatsoever that we have to add to what he's already done. And then last... Legalism, this is, this is for me. Legalism destroys my confidence. It might affect you all different. Beautiful, powerful, never struggle people, you. <laughs> Legalism destroys my confidence. I'm always worried. What do they think? Am I good enough? Did I say the right thing? I was a young preacher. I'm preaching one day on giving. Oh, Jesus. There's this man sitting in the back. And uh, it seemed like every third sentence I said, he just started shaking his head. Shaking his head. Shaking his head. 
I love this man, and I was confident that I could go talk to him after the message. And so I went up to him. I said, Charlie, you were shaking your head the entire time that I was preaching. He said, my wife kept asking me, do you want to go here after church? He said, no. (laughs) What about here? He said, no. He said, what about here? He said, no. I was ruined. Like, I thought I was, I was a mess the entire time. And he just didn't want to go to uh, Golden Corral after church. It was all it was. Check this out. One little verse kind of tucked away, verse 31. Acts chapter 15, we're still talking about. It says, they were sent off. They went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. So listen to what Luke tells us. They read it. Verse 31, Acts 15, they read it. They said, look, we're not laying any burden upon you. It's Christ alone. They read that letter, and look what it says. They rejoiced because of its encouragement. The true gospel provides hope and encouragement and confidence before God. I don't care what y'all did on the way here today. I don't care how bad the fight was. I don't care how bad the headache is because of what you did last night. I don't care what your thoughts are. I don't care what your browsing history is. I don't care about any of it. All I care is that you know there's one way to Father and that it's through Christ Jesus. And let him do the rest. Because you know what happens? On that day, 20-some years ago, in that Methodist church, that I said yes to him, one main thing happened. I lived my entire 22 years of my existence up to that point only caring about me. I call it John-centric. I wasn't self-centered. I was John-centered. I did anything that I wanted to do, whatever made me happy, whatever made me feel good, whatever I wanted. But no matter what those people were telling me I had to do, they couldn't stop one thing. And that was that the moment I said yes to him, Jesus came to dwell inside of me. And when Jesus came to dwell inside of me, I was no longer John-centric. I became Christ-centric. Amen. And it didn't happen overnight. And trust me, it's long. he's long from being done with me. I had a, a keyboard player in a youth group that I led one time, and he had these initials across his keyboard, and it stood for, please be patient, God is not finished with me yet. <laughs> He's going to see on the completion of the work that he began in us. That's a promise. But uh, unfortunately, in my life, he, he's like, yeah, I created you. I know you're a little slow. I'm, I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep working. Yeah, amen. The gospel, the true gospel provides hope and encouragement, confidence. The gospel speaks a better word to us that says, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? I'll be honest, I don't even care who you're voting for in November. I don't care. Vote, but I don't care who you're voting for. I had a guy tell me one time he was preaching. It was one of those moments everything's going along real fine. And then I heard him say something so absurd. I was like, wait, what? I heard a guy tell me say one time in a message that if, if, uh, if you don't vote Republican, you're going to hell. Yeah. Listen, I, that's not true. That's what legalism That's the effect that it will have on you. The gospel speaks a better word. Christ died, yes. He was raised, yes. He's at the right hand of Father, yes. And he's making intercessions on your behalf. The gospel speaks a better word. And if that's the case, for the sake of our mission, for the sake of God's glory, for the sake of our confidence, let's just rest. And what he's done for us. Not worry about all the other nonsense. If I were to to offer you a a bottle of water, pure and clean, you would happily accept it. But if I were to drop just one drop of poison in it, you would say, no, what are you trying to do? I'm like, well, it's mostly good. It's mostly pure. No, one little drop tarnished it. And adding one thing, as little and minuscule as it might seem, tarnishes the gospel. That's not what Leesburg needs from y'all. That's not what Lake County needs. That's not what the world needs. The world needs to see us operating in love and grace, trusting only in him. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much.
for the opportunity to learn together, to be encouraged together, because that's what truth does. It is and always will be freeing. Thank you for your word. And I just pray, Lord, that right now in this moment, as we just spend these last few moments together, uh, first of all, I'd be remiss if uh, I miss this opportunity, Lord. If there's anybody here today that has never accepted you or has wandered and, and thought maybe there's another way, Lord, I just hope that they've seen the goodness of, of your gift, your son. I pray that today might be the day that blind eyes are open and that they see the need for a savior in their life. They just say, yes. Yes, God, I want you. I want that. And Lord, I pray. As I, I, I do believe that many Christians are, are just like me in this sense. That we feel inadequate because we don't perform well enough at work, at church, in our homes, with our children, with our spouse. Or let them understand it has nothing, nothing to do with what you think and what you see. Let them leave here today full of hope and encouragement and that we would be like the author of Hebrews said, that we would not cast away our confidence because in it is a great reward. Lord, if there's any man or woman walking along this earth with swagger, it ought to be that man or woman that has said yes to you. Give us that today, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you. Thank you for bearing with me today. John, uh, that was that was really good for me. I just want to say personally thank you. I'm sure everybody is appreciating that. It's been a, been a wonderful wonderful message today.